All right, now that the helmet tests are done, I'll talk a bit about the results, my personal conclusions. As said in the disclaimer, this is not a scientific test. In order to make it more accurate, I would have to use more historically accurate reproductions. Some of them were more accurate than others, but uh, I'd also have to match the time periods. I just mixed everything based on what I had available, but it would of course be better to use the kind of sword that would have existed alongside that particular helmet. Also having a taller stand, a more realistic neck on the, the zombie head. It's just as it is, it's basically just a plastic tube, so it's quite rigid, whereas a real neck of course has more give, moves around. A shock sensor would be really useful on the head to, to see what kinds of you know, blunt impact trauma that might be. I found those shock watch stickers, which are quite expensive. I considered them, but it doesn't seem quite ideal. They come apparently only in 50G and 100G. I wasn't able to find out exactly what level would be reliably lethal. Uh, from what I've read, 100G would be a concussion, but it wasn't quite clear. And of course, if it's something in between, if it's like 80G, what's that now? It still makes it a little difficult to figure out what that would mean in practical terms. Then the, yeah, the height of the stand, it certainly turned out shorter than I had planned. Uh, I guess some measurement was off or whatever, and then I didn't want to take the entire thing apart and then get more materials and make it longer and then put it back together. Just good enough seemed like it would do. And when it's lower, of course, you get more rotation in the swing. It's potentially more powerful. Uh, like if you, if I have, for example, this is the head, say, and I swing from here. So this is the amount of rotation I would get. Whereas if it's higher, it's not quite as much. So makes a difference. Probably not as much as you might think, because if it's higher, if it's at, at eye level, for example, you can swing in a different way, you know, just, uh, drive the swing more forward and instead of down and also you know aim at a point behind the target so you you just strike through it and th therefore you know transfer as much force as possible so you can still strike it pretty hard even if it's at, at, a, at a taller height um, some people said it's easier to hit but not really it's the same target size and if it was higher I would simply change the angle I might favor some techniques over others but it doesn't make it inherently easier or harder to hit based on the height then of course you have to consider that this is basically worst case scenario strikes because it's a stationary target it, it would be rare to achieve such perfect hits in combat you know dead on, you know, full powered swing without any movement. It's more likely on a battlefield because then they, they, they might not always see the enemy. It gets chaotic. Somebody might, you know, pop up behind somebody and, and just whack him in the, in the helmet, especially if the helmet has limited peripheral vision. There is you know, more chaos that, that can go on. In a one-on-one -on -one duel, it's, you're going to keep your eyes on the opponent, so it's not that likely. The way the stand moves is also different. The stand itself actually moves more than an entire body would, especially when under muscle tension in a fight. But the, the neck would, of course, move, whereas in this case, the entire... The entire stand rocks around, so that absorbs some of the force. Uh, but you know, in a, in a re with a real head and neck, you, it would just, the, the head would be thrown around. It would pivot here and not further down. That's a bit of a difference. Um, considering that these strikes are worst-case scenario, especially Sean's, because he's 
stri striking power is pretty significant to say the least so he delivered some really hefty swings um even the thin helmets weren't actually too bad it's interesting to see the different impressions that people got from this some of you basically said oh thin helmets completely useless that's just it gets destroyed some of you were like hey that's actually pretty good and i have to agree it's considering that a lot of hits in a fight may be partial hits or you know glancing blows or you know not 100 percent force you know something that would cause a significant injury but with the helmet you're safe and the, the even the leather helmet um, it's steel reinforced but it's very very thin steel even that protected against fracturing from my cut with the arming sword and my murder stroke with that sword as well as sean's first long sword cut i reviewed the footage and figured out that his second cut went deep enough to actually cave in the skull that's where you saw that hole in the skull so apparently it dented it far enough and also pushed the helmet down far enough so the uh the suspension liner in there keep some space between the top of the head and the the material of the helmet and of, of course the padding also creates some space but with a lot of force there there is like the liner stretches a bit the the padding gives a bit and it's, it's you can see in the slow-mo footage that it's, it's being pushed down to an extent so that was apparently enough to get you know, deep enough and low enough that it would actually break the skull. This was the only time when the skull was actually fractured. I checked frequently. I didn't show that in the video, but I did. And um, there was no more damage after that. That's important to point out. So there's when the, the weapon actually bites into the helmet deeply, like dents it or, or punches a hole in it, rather than bouncing or skipping off it of course delivers maximum force because you know it's as, as soon as you have that contact and it, it kind of sticks to it, it it cannot slide off in the process of transferring force it goes all right into the the, the helmet and, and also the head and neck the leather helmet can still deflect thrusts pretty well uh, that's generally a feature of the uh, the round like the, the dome shape i mean our heads do that too they are also pretty good at deflecting blows and the um of course when you have a hard smooth surface it's more effective like with the the light norman helmet it, since it is harder material than the than the leather it's better at that of course because it's, it's nice and, and hard and smooth and round so it, it just makes especially thrusts glance off uh, what i found interesting with the leather helmet is that none of the blades cut all the way through the helmet that's what i had anticipated i i thought that at least sean would be able to cut all the way through it but no they the, the um some of the blades cut into the material into the leather and also into the steel to an extent and it collapsed it quite a bit but it didn't go all the way so that really shows you how effective helmets are even something like this can actually stop an edge from penetrating all the way it's dented but you know cut through there are some de medieval depictions and old norse sagas you also have cases mentioned where a sword supposedly cut through a helmet you see that in some images where they, they cut all the way through and, and split the skull. Now, did that happen or not? I don't know. You have to take into account that Viking Hollywood is a thing, so to speak, especially in the sagas. I'm convinced that a lot of the things they describe was just for the for the shock effect basically just like nowadays in movies you have like you know limbs being torn off and flying away and just people being torn in half and all of that it's just to, for the shock value and, and also to express that you know this heroic character this dude was so strong he could cut right through that thing in one go and then you know it's it's outrageous it's supposed to be 
just to, you know, express just how vigorous and, and heroic they are. Could it have happened? Well, maybe. Um, if you have a relatively thin helmet, especially also considering that helmets were not of uniform thickness, some parts of the helmet sides for example were thinner than others so if you have a relatively thin spot a weak spot maybe um made of iron and then you have a steel sword say and a well-made sword not so well-made helmet perhaps it seems plausible i wouldn't expect that to have happened a lot but who knows so the light norman helmet was dented even by the arming sword so it's not very durable, but it still offers decent protection. Again, this makes a difference between having, you know, a cut in your head <laughs> and a dent in the helmet. It's um, certainly, even if the light helmet seems a little underwhelming, it's certainly not very durable, but it still protects. And again, it deflects thrusts. Um, the uh, the all-steel helmet can also be repaired more easily. The leather helmet, if you cut through the leather, well, that's not too much you can do other than put an, a new piece of leather on top or something, you know, patchwork, that kind of thing. This, if it's, if it's dented, you can hammer it back out. Yeah, it's a bit easier to repair. This one was easily punctured by the falks, the hammer spike, and the mace flanges but the suspension liner inside the helmet kept the head high enough that even the surface of the padded cap was barely even scratched. I checked that and it just didn't penetrate far enough to actually touch the head. The pommel throw dented it quite substantially. You have to keep in mind that's a pretty heavy pommel. Uh, many historical pommels were hollow. They weren't that heavy. It depends on the period and the type of sword and all of that. As light armor, this is actually not bad. This kind of helmet is much more comfortable to wear than the thicker helmets. It's a lot lighter. It's not as fatiguing. And, you know, it does an okay job. I wouldn't recommend that for, like, heavy sparring or anything like that. Uh, especially since it gets chewed up pretty quickly. But, you know, it's absolutely better than nothing and together with a sturdy arming cap concussion is still quite likely and various injuries but you know, not too bad the norman mask helmet is about half a millimeter thicker than the previous helmet that does make quite a bit of a difference it's heavier but still comfortable to wear so this is 1.5 to 1.7 millimeters of steel 16 gauge pretty functional it was punctured by the point of the falks, but it didn't go deep. And with the shape of this helmet, it's pretty tall. That keeps the uh, the point really far away from the head. So there's really no risk there. It was severely damaged only by the axe and the warhammer when used with a lot of force. Would that be lethal? Maybe. Neck injury is possible. If you get such a powerful, you know, blow struck to your head then the neck is going to absorb a lot of that so that could break or you know your head could be jerked around so much that you get whiplash or you know as that concussion which can be you know, if it's incapacitating it could be lethal around a corner so to speak because even if you're unconscious only for two or three seconds or, or disoriented enough that you can't react then that may be enough to finish you off so there is that to consider of course one thing i noticed with the warhammer is when the the spike dug in and the follow through of the swing just really jerked the head around quite violently because the, the spike hooks onto it and then the strike travels on it, jerks it around like that. So that could very possibly lead to a brain injury. I recently saw a, a video of a TED talk about concussion, that topic, and apparently the, the traditional idea of what happens during a concussion is inaccurate. The more recent research has shown that it's not the brain sloshing around in there and, and hitting the uh, the skull, but as the head whips around, 
the uh, the brain lags a bit behind that movement and it stretches so the tissue in, inside the brain stretches and that's what actually causes the symptoms of concussion as far as they can tell so they, they uh, show some you know veteran football players added did some research as to how the force acts on the head and they also showed a brain of a long-term football player who had some disorders and you can tell that that brain it has quite a bit of a cavity more so than usual in the center and uh, yeah the stretch tissue is a problem so in this case that would be very relevant if it if it digs in and just you know pulls it around like that that's definitely concussion time and then we have the uh, anglo-saxon copper gate style helmet this one was too thick for one-handed swords to do any significant damage well i should say this kind of one-handed sword a relatively light medieval arming sword is quite a bit different than a viking sword say uh, within viking swords there's also some variation of course but there were some pretty heavy ones uh, comparatively heavy and uh, you know more blade heavy as well so they might do more damage uh, this helmet is very heavy it's 4.3 kilograms it's uh, mainly due to the overlapping parts and you know, several layers as well as the the male aventail and the cheek plates they also add quite a bit the overlapping layers of steel offer tremendous protection i mean you pretty much have no chance of penetrating that even with the mace and the warhammer it's really really thick that's very protective there was massive denting from the heavy percussive weapons but no visible damage to the head as i already said i should have shown the head after each strike but i kind of had to hurry up because we were running out of daylight and you need quite a bit of light for the slow-mo footage to turn out well it's at 100 at 90, 960 fps and that requires a lot of light even if it's overcast that can cause problems so yeah then after the test on this helmet we did the destruction of the the head when we just went at it without helmet and the reason why we did that at that point was all of these helmets aside from the leather helmet all the others protected the head i mean there was no visible fracturing of the fake bone so the heavy bassinet would very obviously protect i mean even the thinnest steel helmet did that it prevented fracturing so the bassinet obviously would not let any damage get through especially with that one it was two arming caps on top of one another and there's just no way lots of padding wouldn't do anything so then the bassinet that one is a full millimeter thicker than the lightest steel helmet it's also the thickest but it's actually lighter than the previous one it weighs 700 grams less than the copper gate helmet it's a uh, 3.6 kilograms so it's um it's quite a bit of weight on the head but it's not too bad actually um, there was a lot of variation in historical helmets some would be a lot thinner than this some would be about as thick or thicker in certain areas because as said some areas were thicker than others and this one was impenetrable by all of the weapons tested uh, denting is really not a big deal with uh, sufficient padding it can be repaired you can hammer it back out and again the dents do not reach far enough down through the padding so all of these helmets are made of mild steel historically many helmets were made of iron or low carbon steel or maybe medium carbon uh, the thing is with the milder steel it dents more easily but as said the dents can be repaired and in fact the person who sent me this helmet said that uh, stainless steel helmets which are much harder tend to crack more easily than this so it's not necessarily an advantage to have an overly hard one but uh, some historical helmets had case hardening so that means that the the very surface of the helmet is harder so that makes it more likely to to uh, make blades glance off and then the 
the layer underneath would be softer, so it wouldn't crack all the way. The visor was surprisingly effective due to the way it flexes. Um, it could perhaps cause a broken nose if it flattens too much. I wasn't able to determine that, but if it's far enough away, it shouldn't really be a problem. Um, and it could take quite a bit of abuse. It was thinner than the main helmet, but because it, it flexed and, and sprang back into shape, it absorbed the, the impact really, really well. Um, overall, when it comes to concussive force, the way uh, role-playing systems handle it with an armor rating, that actually seems like a reasonable mechanic with regards to concussive force. Uh, the armor absorbs some of the blonde impact and the rest can potentially cause injury. Like, for example, if uh, it, the neck absorbs too much and, and breaks or otherwise gets injured. In case of cutting, that doesn't apply. If you, you could have, for example, a light, very sharp saber that could have a high damage rating against unarmored flesh because it cuts really deeply and, and severs arteries and all that, but it would be useless against steel plate because it cannot penetrate. So the the theoretical damage that it it does in excess of the armor rating just becomes meaningless because there is not enough blunt impact force and if it cannot cut through it can't do anything and this is really what happens with the helmets you cannot cut through them even the lightest helmet just it's not gonna work what you need is apply enough blunt impact force to dent that to crush the head underneath or you know to to whip it around so violently that you cause concussion and, and all of that. So, yeah, I hope you learned a few things from this. I certainly did myself, and hopefully you found it entertaining. So, either way, thanks for watching.